I've been doing a lot of research on this subject, and it seems like there are a lot of people that have had encounters with, well, something. I recently had an experience like this too, but I've not been able to find any solid evidence that proves what it was. But I'm still pretty consumed with trying to figure it all out. I'm not convinced it's aliens or cryptids, but I'm also not sure it's humans like a lot of people think. You know, humans trying to trick people. Anyway, the other stories I've read were of people that were out in nature and saw something they couldn't explain, and that's what happened to me. I was at a campground in the Smoky Mountains. I was sitting near a creek watching the sunset and enjoying the breeze coming off the mountains. At that point, I had to be about 30 yards from the nearest trees. My girlfriend was beside me and was asleep on a blanket we had laid out on the ground. I was about to wake her up so we could head back when I noticed something move behind one of the trees. The motion was very fast, and it was alarming because it didn't seem like a natural movement. I turned and looked at my girlfriend and saw that she was still very asleep. So then I looked back towards the movement and I saw it again, but this time it was moving in a line from tree to tree. It was a very fast movement, and it was clearly different from the movement of a branch swaying in the wind or anything like that. Also, it was very tall, and as I watched it, I could make out that it had something that looked like a head, but it was pointed down towards the ground. I snapped a picture of it as it was moving, but the picture ended up being too dark to make anything out, and it just looks like a bunch of trees. But at the point that I took the picture, I thought I was looking at a monkey albeit a really big one, or an ape or something like that. But then as quickly as it appeared, it was gone. I literally had no other interaction with this thing other than these few minutes, so that's all I can really share with you. After that, it was basically uneventful. I just woke my girlfriend up and we headed back to our tent for the night. And then the rest of our trip moved on just as planned. So I hope this is interesting enough. Maybe you'll even... Hey Lilith, I really like your show, and I think I have a story that's not like anything I've heard you talk about so far. Actually, I don't really know what it is. I mean, I really don't know what I saw, but I'm convinced it's something that the government doesn't want us to know about. I'm sure of that. I work on an oil rig drilling wells out in the Gulf of Mexico. It's a good setup mostly. We do two weeks on, two weeks off, and the pay is higher than most jobs on land here in South Louisiana. The rig I work on is big, and I'm part of a crew of about 100 people. We'll work 12 hours a day while we're on our two-week hitch, and our rig is just off the coast near Venice, Louisiana. When we're off duty, there's a gym, a theater, a few pool tables, lots of the guys are into fishing, and they do that when they're not working. I never got into it until I got on the rig, but I let my buddy Jackson hook me up. He has all the fishing gear. Depending on what shift we are on, we might be out there early in the morning or late at night, just waiting for the fish to bite. If we got a good tuna or something, we'd get the rig cooked to fillet and cook it. Anyway, fishing is a lot of staring out into the ocean, and there's not much to see out there, so if there's anything, you'll notice it. One day, we were sitting out there, and I saw a ship. Not a big deal normally. Ships do come and go, but they're usually pretty far away. But this one was close enough, though, that I could see the flag it was flying. But it looked to me a lot like Old Glory, and so I figured it was a U.S. Navy ship. The weird part was that the ship hung around a while. They don't usually do that, at least not that I've ever noticed. I asked Jackson, and he said no, it wasn't normal for one to hang around near a rig, especially not a Navy ship. We do get ships out there, of course, hauling oil or doing other jobs for the oil business. But neither of us could figure out what this Navy ship was doing, though. We saw it a couple more times on that hitch, just sort of hanging around, and I had a bad feeling about it, but I wasn't sure why. I'd never had that feeling about a ship before, just something seemed off. On the next hitch, Jackson wasn't there. We'd gotten off each other's schedules, apparently. I'd been thinking about the ship, so I borrowed some binoculars from a friend who's into birding. 
I thought maybe I could see more about what was going on. Sure enough, while I was fishing one morning, I caught sight of the ship again, just stalling around near the rig. Not near enough that I could tell what was going on, though. But I trained the binoculars on it, and it took me a while, but I finally located some activity. Off one side, I could see some people heaving something to the edge of the ship. It was hard to see what it was, really. I trained the binoculars on it, and it looked like a big box. And then they shoved it over the side, and it sank right away from what I could see. After that, the ship turned and slowly glided away. I watched for the next few mornings, and each time the ship came, dropped something in the water, and left. Everything they dumped looked similar, like huge boxes, maybe the size of a compact car. I was curious, so I asked around on the rig, and no one knew anything about the ship, or they didn't want to say. I felt like a couple people acted nervous, like maybe they did know something, but didn't want to open their mouths about it. Then during the next two-week hitch, I was at it again with the binoculars, and this time Jackson was back with me. We were on the day shift and started fishing in the evening. I saw the ship come near sunset, and we traded the binoculars back and forth. We couldn't see any activity this time, or at least not with people tossing things overboard. But we did see people moving around the deck. And I was still curious, and I wanted to know why that ship would just be sitting there. On the second evening, though, things started to heat up. At least, that's what my impression was. A lot of people, maybe 20 or 30, crowded on the deck and they had a bunch of big black bags that they were hauling around. Looked like they were heavy. Two people had to carry each one. I asked Jackson what he thought they were, and he said, body bags. I took the binoculars back, and that is exactly what they looked like. There were a lot, maybe a hundred. But why would the Navy be hauling around a hundred body bags? I asked him. I mean, wouldn't we have heard it on the news if that many Navy guys had died? It was weird, all around weird. We decided to try to track the ship and find out what it was and why it was there. I'd written down the dates and the times that we'd seen it, but when we checked the ship tracking websites, it didn't show any ship being there at those times. Once we figured out how to track ships, we used our last few days on the hitch to watch for it any time we could. We saw it one more time, but it didn't show up on the tracking site. Also that time... We didn't see it dump anything. We also borrowed a shortwave radio and searched for messages coming from the ship, but there was nothing at all. No matter what we tried, we could find no concrete evidence that it existed. Like it wasn't even there, except that we could see it. I'm convinced someone was hiding that ship. They didn't want anyone to know it had been there, and whatever it was dumping was something that they wanted to hide, too. Obviously. I wish I could have gotten a better look at it. The next time I go out, if I'm on that same rig, I'll look for it again and let you know. Hi Lilith, I was recommended to your channel by a friend of mine. After he heard what I'd been through, he told me that I just had to get in touch with you. I've got to admit, I really didn't want to talk about it, but maybe it's time to get some of this out. So it all started during my friend Deanna's bachelorette party. We had all decided to surprise her with a beach trip over to the Jersey Shore, and it was filled with just cute, girly stuff, things we've been planning for, like, months. Matching ribbons, pink wine glasses, selfie props, all kinds of good fun. But it wasn't. We'd been partying at the beach all day, and when we got back to the Airbnb, we remembered that we had left a cooler down at the beach. So I volunteered to run out and get it. I was walking with my phone flashlight, but basically everything was pitch black. I saw a beam of light out in the distance on the ocean, sort of like a police helicopter beam. I thought it was odd, but I kept making my way down to the beach, and then I saw it just like this disgusting figure staring back at me. At first I thought it was a man, but there was something deeply wrong with it. It was too tall, too skinny, and its head was way too big. Its body was frail and its eyes were a deep black, and there was something behind those eyes that I felt was sort of pulling me. 
Even though I knew better, there was something about it that drew me closer. I just kept walking closer and closer, and soon enough I was about 15 feet from this thing. The skin I could see now was smooth, like a dolphin, but with bulging veins all over it. And at the end of its skinny arms were these long, thin fingers that didn't stop moving. They looked like jellyfish tentacles. And if it wasn't for that massive head, it would almost look human, although someone extremely malnourished and with knobby knees. Soon enough, I was only ten feet away, and I realized that this thing had no mouth or nose, just an empty space where those things should be. And all this time, those deep black eyes were deadlocked straight at me. I felt a ringing in my ears, too, that began to grow sharper and louder with each step I took. The sound vibrated in my skull and surrounded me completely. And then it started to turn into a low hum. The figure began to then vibrate a bit as well, and I couldn't look away from the piercing eyes. And even though I was initially scared and confused, the sound started to calm me. It sounded like a terrifying lullaby, and I felt hypnotized as I grew closer and closer. Suddenly, a bright white light began to shine down from the sky, and it blinded me for a minute. So I bent down, and I covered my eyes with my hands. And then after the initial shock of the white flare, I peered out from my fingers, and the creature was gone and the beach was pitch black again. Again, I used my cell phone flashlight one more time, and I scanned the area, but I couldn't see anything besides the sand and the dunes and the steadily rolling waves. I took a deep breath, and I immediately regretted it. There was a strong stench, almost like rotting eggs and mulch. I couldn't see anything that could have caused this smell, so I think it could have been from the thing that I saw. Once I regained my composure, I turned around and walked back to the Airbnb. All the girls asked me what took so long and why I didn't have the cooler, but I just needed to get to my room and be alone. They told me I'd been gone for over an hour and that they had been out walking up and down the beach looking for me. It only felt like a few minutes out on that beach to me, and I definitely didn't hear or see anyone else out there. Needless to say, I couldn't sleep that night. I sat there staring at the ceiling the entire night, and in the morning, I decided to leave the rest of the girls and head home. My friends were sad to see me go, but I just couldn't explain what I had seen without sounding totally crazy. I wanted to just forget about that creature. I wanted to just leave it on the beach and carry on like normal. But every time I closed my eyes to go to sleep, all I could see were those black eyes peering back at me. A few times, I would wake up sweating as if I were shaken by a piercing hum, and this carried on for one full week, and then one night, it just stopped. It took me another few weeks to really acknowledge what I had seen, but eventually I began to deep dive on Google to try to figure out what it could have been. After reading about a thousand blog posts, a hundred wiki threads, and a million dead ends, I came to terms with the fact that I'd seen an alien. There have been a few sightings here on the East Coast, especially on the shore, and that bright beam of light must have been its ship. I'm thinking of going back down to that beach. I'm not scared, for some reason. The longer I think about it, the more certain I am that there are more of this kind out there, and more coming, too. If any other listeners of your show have had similar experiences, I would love to get in touch. Thanks for listening. Hi, Lilith. I love your show, and I hope that you'll let me share this story. I'm a semi-truck driver, and most of my routes take me across the south through Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. During one of my routes, I stopped at a Love's truck stop near New Orleans, and this one had a subway in it. So while I was having my usual roast beef sandwich, this old man came up to me. I figured he wanted money, since I didn't know him. I gave him a couple bucks, but he didn't leave but he started saying this crazy stuff. I should have left, but I just sat there and listened to him. I guess I was bored. He was talking about something called the loop guru, which he said meant werewolf. He said it goes after little kids who are bad, stuff like that. 
He said it looks like a dog that walks on its back legs and smells like rotten eggs and howls at night. I was really starting to wonder how to best get away from this guy at this point. But the guy seemed totally serious. I mean, it was obvious that he really believed in this stuff. But I thought it was BS, excuse my language, and just an old story people used to tell their kids to keep them in line. You know, like, be good or the loop guru will get you. Well, I did manage to get away from him eventually, but I've come to believe that that dude really did see something and it drove him crazy. Like, for real crazy. I'll tell you why. One night a few months later, I stopped at the Rest Stop Welcome Center near the Louisiana-Mississippi border. If you haven't seen it, it's supposed to look like an old plantation house or something. It's white or off-white with pillars in front. And during the day, the volunteers sit in there and they hand out maps and free coffee. There's also a bank of vending machines out to the side and the little shack, and that part Plus, the bathrooms are both open 24 hours a day. Behind that, there's woods, I guess. It's pretty busy during the day with the trucks and cars coming and going, with people walking their dogs and all that. But at night, it's a different story. The night I saw the thing, I'd been driving too long. You're supposed to stop after 14 hours, absolute max according to FMSCA rules. But we all know how to push the limits, and I'd been going at least an hour longer than that. So when I got out of the truck, I was stumbling a little. I headed for the main building first, you know, where the restrooms are. They're open 24 hours, and I guess it was around midnight. It's still pretty well lit normally, but some of the lights near the back of the building looked to be burnt out. So the entrance to the restroom is kind of outside, just in this outdoor hallway, really. I thought it was weird that the lights were out. They're usually really careful about that because of safety. So as I walked towards the restroom entrance, it was really dark. I used the restroom, but when I came out, I noticed that all the other cars and trucks had left except for one that was very far back and away from my truck. And that was weird, too, that it was empty because it's a nice rest stop, and truckers like to stop there if they can time it right. I wanted to leave but I really needed a Coke if I was going to keep driving, so I walked over to the outside vending machine area. The lights were on there, got a Coke and some Fritos. I started back to my truck, and that old dude's story just popped into my head. I don't know why, but it was almost like I could picture that loop guru he described. I looked over at the other side of the welcome center. There's mowed grass and picnic tables there, but behind the road that leads out of the rest area... It's forest. Some of the lights that way were out, too. Anything could live in those woods, really. The trees get real thick, real quick. And I remembered the old man said the loop guru lives in the forest or the swamp. And that's when I heard the howl. It didn't sound like a dog or a coyote. I had heard them before. This was more like a human. Well really like in between a human and a wolf or something. I turned around quickly because it sounded like it came from behind me, back behind the restroom entrance, past that dark hallway. I should have started running, but I was afraid that if I did, whatever it was would follow me. I thought if I stood still, maybe it wouldn't see me. Maybe it would go away. While I was looking, one of those lights snapped on. You know how those fluorescents do sometimes. It flashed like lightning almost, and I swear I saw a dog standing. It was just behind the building, near where some of the trees started. The thing was tall, taller than me for sure. I was glad it was pretty far away and the light near me hadn't gone on. I thought maybe it didn't see me. Maybe it did, though, because it threw back its head and I saw that long snout pointing towards the dark sky. And it howled again, louder this time. And then that light near it popped back off. I was actually more scared when I couldn't see it anymore. I remember the old dude saying that the loop guru could run fast. I thought it could be running towards me in the dark. That thought got me moving and I ran to my truck, got in and locked the doors. The engine is loud, but even over the rumbling, I swear I heard another howl. Closer this time. I shifted gears and I got out of there as fast as I could. 
I haven't stopped at that rest area since. I've been listening to your show for a while now, and it's great. Thank you for the work you do. I've been thinking about when to share something that happened to me growing up, and now seems like a good of time as any. I grew up in the late 90s near St. Helens, Oregon, which is half an hour directly north of Portland. It's forest on all sides, except for where it reaches down to the Columbia River there, a big logging town back in the day. I had a summer job between my sophomore and junior year working for my aunt and uncle. Basically, they owned a lot of property up on the hills and would grow specific trees and then let a company come in and cut down acres at a time for lumber. They'd have me go through and sort of clear out brush in specific areas to make it easier for the trucks to get through if the roads were overgrown. It was probably my third week hacking blackberry bushes, up there by myself in 90-plus heat with a machete. Not the best job I've ever had. So I got to the end of a road, and there's this sort of a clearing there. It was super silent, except for the bugs buzzing everywhere. And then I hear this giant crack like a branch falling, which was pretty typical, or at least not unusual. But then it happened a second time, and then a third. And when it continued to happen, I knew that this wasn't just some trees falling. There was somebody or something nearby making this noise on purpose. Basically, this was before cell phones were a big thing. Nobody really had them. So I had to make a choice. One, I could go back down the road to my truck, probably three quarters of a mile, or two, I could wait and see if this sound continued and what it was. Back then, I was a whole lot braver than I am now, or I guess you could call it stupid. Fine line between the two, I guess. I stayed where I was, standing in the clearing, machete in my left hand. The branches or trees or whatever it was continued to crash, and it seemed to be getting louder and closer it went silent all of a sudden, and right then something whipped past my head, and then something else. I looked down, and I thought it was rocks at first glance, but found out eventually that it was actually chunks of dirt, like they had been ripped out of the ground, one handful at a time. And then the chunks kept coming, and the pieces were getting bigger. One was the size of a football, and then a tire, and so on. I was surprised I hadn't been hit. I mean, I'd been dodging these incoming piles, but there was a lot of it coming at me. And then again, it went silent, and the chunks stopped coming, and the branches started crashing again. Suddenly, what looked like an entire tree then came hurling down the hill. I jumped off to avoid it and knocked myself to my feet. Then there was this huge amount of dust in the air, and I'm completely covered in that dry, splintery kind of wood. I then looked up to where it had all been coming from, and I swear to God, there's a guy standing there. Well, sort of a guy. I mean, it's Oregon, so somebody living in the woods off the land wouldn't be as unusual as it would be in some other places. But this guy, he's huge. Like 12, maybe 15 feet? It's hard to tell because he's on a hill and he's up above me, but this was not just a Bigfoot like some people would think. I wiped the dirt and the wood from my face and I looked back up and now he's gone. And then I hear it. The crashing goes on for a while and I feel like he's running away because the noise keeps getting quieter and further. I then took advantage of the quiet knowing everything was at least at a standstill. And then I took off back to my truck as fast as I could. When I got back to it, I wheeled it around, took off faster than I should have in four-wheel drive. Also, I never went back. I quit that job even though my parents threw a fuss because my aunt and uncle were annoyed, but there was no way I was going back up there. I told them what happened and then they went up and looked around. I think they didn't expect to find what I described, so they figured out a way to just rationalize it. They said it was obviously a landslide, but I know that it wasn't a landslide. That wouldn't have even happened in that area. The way those chunks of dirt were tossed through the air, it was like somebody was aiming for me. So then, I've tried to see if anyone else has had a similar experience up there. I ask as many people as I can who have lived in this area for a while. Once I met this one guy who works at a pawn shop, 
He said he had a similar sort of an experience happen to him. He said it happened back in the 80s when he was hiking on the other side of the same hill that I was on. We've gotten together a couple of times and compared descriptions of what we remember it looking like. He thought it was even taller than I did. And he said he remembers having... And he said he remembers it having this weird sloping back with these long arms that were longer than normal and really dark yellow eyes. I can tell you for a fact that there was somebody there. And I can also tell you for a fact that it was not a Bigfoot, like lots of people who would want to instantly say when they think of a creature in the woods of Oregon. However, I've come to believe that it was a mountain troll protecting its territory. My relative sold that piece of property eventually without felling any of the trees. I don't know who ended up with it, but I think about going up there again one day and seeing what, if anything, they've encountered. Hey there, Lilith. I'm a big fan of the show and thankful for the work you do. I'm hoping you can get my story out there so I can get in touch with others in my area who might have seen this creature too. I'm from Asbury Park, New Jersey, and I can tell you for a fact that the Jersey Devil has been out and about this past summer. There's a few reasons why I know it's been out. Basically, there have been signs of its presence. And, well, I've actually spotted it in person myself, so I know that it's here. So basically, the Jersey Devil has been well-known lore around here, but I always figured it was just BS. But now, I'm real worried, and I suspect that it's here to stay for a while. Maybe it was in hibernation, or left for a while, or whatever. But for the last ten years, I think it's not been around. When I was young, there were always rumors, and they came up with some precautions, like keeping the lid on the trash can and making sure the cats stay inside the house. Once it hadn't been spotted for a while, people started to get more lax. They let their dogs off leash in the woods and made compost piles in the backyard, and they let their kids run around on the streets. But the first sign of the return of the Jersey Devil was the trash cans. Right on Fairview Avenue in the middle of town, all of the trash cans had been dumped over and spilled into the street. Now, this was a Tuesday, too, so it was pickup day and the garbage man was completely irritated at the mess when he came around at about 5 a.m. We later learned that there was someone who had had a house party and took their recyclables out on that street around 3 a.m. with no issues. So the Jersey Devil must have visited sometime between 3 and 5 a.m. All right, so everyone maybe thought it just could have been the wind knocking over the bins, but I know it wasn't that because all the cans and bags of dog food and hamburger meat and fish were completely clean. I mean, nothing left, like they had been licked. The next weird thing to happen was that I started to notice lots and lots of posters for missing animals being put up. It seemed like every block had a new one. Some cat or dog that had been last seen in the backyard just up and vanished. You might have thought it was a coyote or a hawk or something, but there were big dogs that had gone missing, too. Like, how could a hawk pick up a Great Dane? It just couldn't. I started asking around if anyone thought it was the Jersey Devil, but nobody really wanted to think about that. I think sometimes people just get too worked up and scared to face reality. And the reality was that there was a creature among us. A neighbor of mine has been raising some chickens in her backyard ever since quarantine, and it wasn't long before I was woken up one morning to her screaming. The entire coop was a mess with feathers scattered all over and scratches at the door. It was like a terrible crime scene, and I knew who the culprit had to be. I decided to ask around to see if anybody could have had a ring camera or something, thinking maybe they had gotten a video of it, but no one in the area had one. So... Since nobody else seemed to be taking this seriously except for me at this point, I decided to be the one to get a photo of this thing. I bought myself a trail cam at Bass Pro Shops. It seemed good enough and it connects over Wi-Fi and Bluetooth so I can see it at all times. It takes a photo and a 15 second video any time it gets triggered. It can get triggered so long as there's movement within the frame. 
so I set it up right in my backyard on Fairview Avenue. The first few nights I didn't see anything, only birds and squirrels running over to inspect it, but then at some point I realized I needed to set up some bait. The thought actually crossed my mind that live bait would have been best, but I'm not cool like that, so I just went down to the grocery store. I picked up a whole rotisserie chicken, put it out that night in front of the camera, and when I went to check on it in the morning, the chicken was gone. I immediately pulled up the trail cam app and tried to see what kind of shot I got. There was nothing there except a 15-second clip at 4.06 a.m. when the chicken was visible. But then suddenly, it wasn't. It was gone. It was unbelievable. The chicken had vanished into thin air. I looked as closely as I could at the footage, but I couldn't make out anything but the hint of a shadow racing across the screen. Even when I played it back in super slow motion, I couldn't make anything out. I decided to set the trap again, but stay awake this time. Instead of just one chicken, I placed a line of six in a row. A big meal for this fella to draw him out. I had a few cups of coffee and just sat there by my window watching and waiting. It was a long night. Just as I was nodding off and my eyes were starting to droop, I saw the same shadowy figure race by. It stopped for a split second at each chicken before flying to the next. It had broad wings and a black body that galloped along. Just as quickly as it came, it was gone, flying up into the air and out of sight. The camera footage just doesn't do it justice, since it only captured the same grainy shadow swooping in and back and forth before I watched the chickens disappear. But Lilith, please post this as a warning. I know the Jersey Devil is out here in Asbury Park, and residents need to be taking precautions. Keep your dogs and cats inside, close the lids on your garbage, and please, please, if you can only do one thing, just stay inside at night. Thank you. June 27, 2017, Mackinac Island State Park, Michigan. I used to be what you would call a workaholic, with little, if any, free time to myself. I worked in the tech department of a big corporation in Ann Arbor, and I'd been dedicating myself non-stop to back-breaking hours of sorting through code, beta testing, and other difficult tasks, and it was all starting to get to me. I'd finally reached a breaking point one day when I was rushed to the hospital after suddenly collapsing at work. Needless to say, this led to me being given some time off. So then I decided that spending time outdoors would maybe be a productive way to counteract some of the negative effects of the long work hours. So a few days into my break, I called up my brother, and together we made plans for the two of us to spend some time exploring Mackinac Island State Park. My brother is the outdoorsy type. He was always ready to explore and enjoy anything that pertained to being outside. And on one of those past adventures, he was introduced to Mackinac Island by some friends. And ever since, I could never hear the end of how great it was there. So that's how we came to decide that that would be our destination. Well, as expected, he was elated to hear I was finally giving in to going there with him. And we made plans for him to pick me up the next day, which was Friday, and head north with plans to spend the entire week exploring every nook and cranny of the island. So the next day, he made the drive to my house and arrived around 2 o'clock to pick me up for the 250-mile journey north to the island from Ann Arbor. We anticipated that we wouldn't get into the island until later in the evening since vehicles aren't allowed there and we would need to leave our car parked at the ferry company in Mackinac City. So after a couple of pit stops along the drive to get some much-needed food, we finally made it to the island later that same day. Thank God we managed to catch the last ferry just by the skin of our teeth. We were exhausted from our long journey, but I was still looking forward to exploring the island and everything it had. The next morning we got up, and right away my brother proposed checking out an unexplored patch of wilderness to keep us away from all the hustle and bustle. He promised that, although camping wasn't permitted there, he had been introduced to a spot where visitors can secretly have a true outdoor experience. He told me he was shown the spot by a past guide on one of his previous stays. 
So we finally arrived at a woodland area near the water that seemed to go on further than I could see. It also had some really big rock formations there that helped make sure we didn't get lost in all the lush foliage. So we'd been on the island for about a day or so at that point when my brother got us to the spot where we started a campfire amongst the trees. And even though we weren't sure if it was legal there or not, there was evidence we weren't the first to do it since we could see the remnants of a previous campfire, one that looked as though it had been made and abandoned only a few days ago. So my brother got to making the campfire by himself. He had also managed to carry in with him the makings of some s'mores, which I was happy to see. Everything was going well, and I really did start to feel as though my spirit and physical health were getting a boost. Well, this was until nighttime started to kick in at around nine o'clock at night when the rustling of the wind in the background turned into what sounded like somebody rustling around in the bushes. At first we thought it might be somebody from the island who had just wandered into the forest near us, but after my brother called out in the direction of the noise and there was no response, we assumed it was an animal. But we could immediately tell that whatever was lurking in the bushes was really big by the way the trees were shaking and the ground was rumbling and the sound of branches cracking as they were being walked over. My brother's calling out only seemed to entice whatever it was and the noise got louder and came closer to our campsite. Soon we were shocked as we started to make out some features from the silhouette in the dark. What my brother and I saw coming towards us made us so scared we could do nothing to react, just stare in absolute fear. What we saw staring right at us was a huge creature so tall it stood equal in height to a smaller pine tree behind it, maybe seven or seven and a half feet tall. It stood on two legs, and from what we remember, it remained standing the entire time, just looking at us. Its body, especially its torso, looked similar to that of a man, but it was completely covered in fur. And then the face resembled a wolf. It had a short snout, and its mouth grimaced at us in a horrifying snarl, and we could see drool shining and dripping from its fangs. It stopped short of coming completely out of the dark and into the light of the fire as we looked at it in absolute terror. It was almost as if we were in a standoff with us staring at it and it staring back at us. My brother then mustered enough courage to reach for a decent-sized stick we had used to cook the s'mores and as soon as he did, the creature took notice. It obviously recognized our very small act of aggression and it quickly took off back to where it came from. Despite its menacing appearance, I'm now thinking that it must have just been more curious of us than anything, considered nothing happened. We instinctively reacted to its departure, and without talking to each other, we snuffed out the fire, left the campsite, and headed in a direction opposite of where it had gone. To this day, my brother and I periodically talk about it. We remind each other that we both saw it, and we know that what we saw was really there. I think having him is about the only thing keeping me sane about it at this point. Thank you, Lilith. Hi, Lilith. I need to tell you something that happened to me last year. I was sitting on my porch at my house in Washington State late at night when I heard a high-pitched whirring noise, and then I saw something quite strange. It was a vibrant blue light that appeared to be spinning, and it slowly went higher up into the sky and gradually spun faster and faster, eventually disappeared behind a cloud, and the whirring noise stopped. Fascinated, I continued looking, waiting for the light to come back, but it didn't. And then suddenly I heard a huge explosive boom, and the cloud lit up this bright green color. It was so bright it was blinding. And it was an amazing and bewildering sight, nothing like anything I had ever seen before in my life. The blue light was spinning so fast it looked like a bright star shooting across the sky. The green light that followed was just as spectacular. It lit up the entire cloud in this brilliant hue and it created this incredible spectacle. I stood there amazed at the sight, completely mesmerized. I couldn't take my eyes off of it. Afterwards, I saw green lights falling from behind the clouds towards the ground. And I remember thinking that somebody has to be playing a prank on me, but it was far too epic to be any kind of a simple prank. 
I remember being concerned if some of the green debris would fall on somebody's house or cause a fire, but there was really nothing I could do. I was in awe and I couldn't stop gazing and wondering if I was even dreaming. I thought that was going to be the most eventful part of the night, but I was wrong. Something quite disturbing happened afterwards. A strange-looking black van drove slowly into the field in front of my house. The windows were all blacked out, and it drove very slowly. Now, I don't get many visitors in this area. Nobody really lives around me. So I got very weirded out by the van. It disturbed me enough that I went into the house, locked the door, and looked out the window. The van sat in the field for about ten minutes. Finally, I decided maybe I was being paranoid and just fixed myself some tea. But while drinking it, I kept trying to come up with a logical explanation for what I had seen in the sky. But for the life of me, I couldn't explain it. It had to be extraterrestrial. Either that or it had been some strange experimental government aircraft. But why the green explosion? I looked out the window again about 30 minutes later and the van was still sitting in the field. I called my husband, who works as a truck driver and was in a different state at the time, and I asked him what I should do. He told me it was probably nothing but to keep watching and call him if anything did happen. I hung up and tried to laugh it off, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. I went back outside and sat down on the porch. My mind was racing with the possibilities of who was in the van. I eventually told myself it was just some teenagers doing, well, teenage things in the field and laughed it off. The van suddenly then began to move. I told myself that the teenagers had finished whatever they had come to do and a sense of relief came over me. Then it drove very slowly in the direction of my house and then stopped right in front. Now my heart started pounding as I was wondering what was going on and suddenly all the doors of the van opened and four men dressed in black suits with sunglasses jumped out. I was terrified and didn't know what to do. They were all holding guns, and they started running at me. As they came closer, I could see that their faces were covered with masks. I tried to run into the house, but one of them grabbed me and dragged me back outside. They took me to the van and forced me inside. The last thing I saw before they shut the door was four more men getting out of the back of the van with rifles. And then the van drove away, leaving me alone with these masked strangers. I remember waking up after that, confused and disoriented with a pounding headache. I felt the grass on my hands, and I started to look around. Once the blurriness left my eyes, I realized I was in my front yard. I immediately ran inside and called my husband, screaming and crying. He told me to calm down and that he couldn't understand me. After taking some deep breaths and forcing myself to calm down, I was able to tell him what happened while holding back tears. I told him I thought it had something to do with the strange lights that I had seen in the sky. What are you talking about? He asked me. The blue light and the green explosion that I told you about earlier, I screamed. But there was a pause. What light are you talking about? He told me I must be in shock from the trauma and I needed to call 911. He had no recollection of me calling him earlier that night. So this experience has caused me a lot of suffering and confusion. My husband tries to be here for me, but he doesn't really understand. I think about that experience daily. And when I tell people, not many of them believe me. In fact, it has cost me a lot, including some friends and family, my career, my credibility, basically everything. I hope that I can soon heal from this experience and get some closure I really need to move on with my life and pull everything back together. Anyway, I love your show, Lilith, and thank you for inspiring me to reach out about this experience. Thank you again. Hi, Lilith. I'm a big fan of your channel, and I want to tell you about a terrifying experience that I had while camping in the Everglades in South Florida. My husband left our tent in the middle of the night to use the facilities, and I woke up when I heard him flat out running back to our campsite. He looked absolutely terrified when he got back to the tent, and he instantly motioned for me to stay quiet and follow him. 
I tried to ask what was going on, but he just kept saying, wait, wait, as we walked through the darkness. As we approached the cinder block building that housed the restrooms, I started hearing weird, squeaky grunt noises, and I assumed that he'd come across boars or something. But we walked around the building, back into near total darkness, and it took a few minutes for my eyes to adjust. We then followed a well-worn path for a bit, and I wondered how he knew where he was going when he pulled me into the trees. The sound got louder, and suddenly he squeezed my hand and pointed through some leafy plants to what looked like a huddle of large birds. But then, one of those creatures stood up on two legs. It was a gigantic reptilian creature. It must have been nine feet tall, and it looked like a cross between a human and an alligator. I thought I was imagining the distended jaw, but the moon suddenly came out and illuminated the bizarre facial features. It had half of an enormous snake hanging out of its mouth, and the other half of the snake was clutched in its massive claws. I stood completely still, waiting for my brain to process what my eyes were seeing. I could feel my husband shaking next to me, but I couldn't keep myself from gasping when two more creatures, smaller than the first but still massive, straightened up and looked directly towards the plants we were hiding behind. And because I could feel my husband shaking next to me, I knew I wasn't imagining things. My rational brain kept telling me that since Matt had managed to make his way back to our campsite earlier, that we would be able to get away. But my lizard brain was pumping adrenaline through my body, and I was resisting the fight-or-flight instinct that was screaming at me to turn and run. I don't think I blinked once. I was terrified that they would move closer to our hiding spot in the millisecond that my eyes would be closed. The creatures stood completely still with their snouts pointed in our direction. I was convinced that they were trying to find us by smelling us, but we were downwind of the light breeze that was moving through the woods. Then after what seemed like an eternity, my husband grabbed my arm and motioned back towards the path. I took tiny steps. I was terrified of stepping on a stick or crunchy leaves or anything else that would give us away. Once we got back to the path, we walked slowly for about a hundred yards or so, but soon I couldn't take it anymore and I started running flat out towards our campsite, looking over my shoulder the entire time. We spent the rest of the night in our truck with our headlights pointed in the direction that we'd come from. Neither of us slept a wink, but we agreed that we felt better with the metal shell of the vehicle between us and whatever was out there. We were hours away from home, and we were both still freaked out that it definitely was not a good idea for either of us to drive at that point. But still, we knew we both wanted to go back to that spot once the sun was up to see what it looked like in the daylight. The only question I asked him was, how did you find your way back to that spot the second time? And he said, he just followed the sounds, just like the first time. The hours passed and the sun started to rise, but I wanted full daylight before we headed back out. As we made our way back to that spot where we had seen these creatures, we listened for those strange pig-like noises we had heard the night before, but we didn't hear anything. I didn't know if we would be able to find the area again, but Matt pointed out our sneaker prints in the dirt of the path and soon we were standing in the same spot where we had been hiding the night before. After making sure the coast was clear, we made our way carefully toward the area where the creatures had been huddled that night before. But the only indication that something had happened there during the night was a small scattering of rattlesnake rattles and a few humongous footprints that looked like they'd been left by dinosaurs. Hi Lilith, I love your channel. I listen frequently with my father, so naturally you were the first person we thought of when we experienced what we did last weekend while camping in the Black Hills of South Dakota. The first sign of trouble came at around dusk. It had been a hot and muggy day, so we waited until the sun started setting to begin our fire and prepare our dinner. Dad set the cast iron over the flame, getting it ready to cook the walleye we had caught and filleted earlier. But it wasn't long until this awful, rotting flesh smell overtook the campsite. At first, we thought maybe the fish had somehow gone bad, but when we checked it for a closer sniff, it was clear that the smell wasn't coming from it. We hadn't encountered the smell all day long. 
not even in the hottest part of the day when you would think a rotting carcass would be at its worst. Even still, we decided to search the area for any evidence of an animal down or decaying nearby. It would just be our luck to have set up camp near a rotting animal. We walked up and down the nearby trails, sniffing and looking, but nothing. There were no rotting corpses that we could find, and even stranger, the rotting smell seemed to get stronger no matter where we went. It was as if the entire forest itself was engulfed or rotting away all around us. What we did find and found kind of strange were deeply embedded hoof prints that seemed to belong to a very large deer. My dad was especially awestruck by this, having worked with game fish in parks for most of his life, and he had never seen deer-type prints of that size before. We eventually decided to make our way back to camp since we hadn't been able to figure out the source of the smell, so by that time it was starting to get dark, and the smell of course only continued to get worse despite there being no obvious source. When we returned to the campsite, we pulled the fish back out of the cooler, cooked it up, but by that time, neither one of us had much of an appetite. As we sat around the fire, poking around at our plates, trying to avoid any and all discussion of the surrounding smell, I began to hear something moving around in the far-off bush. Listen, do you hear that? I asked Dad. Whatever it was was sizable enough to be snapping what sounded to be big branches as it moved through the trees. My dad shrugged. There's nothing too dangerous in these parts, he said. He was trying to reassure me, but I could tell from his face and the sound of his voice that he was actually a little spooked himself. I thought about asking him if he wanted to pack up and leave early. I was really hoping he would just say yes, but we were both putting on a good act for each other, pretending we were fine. I was afraid to ask him outright, though, because if I was wrong about him being afraid, I didn't want to look like I was a wuss on the trip. What the hell? my dad then said. I nearly jumped out of my camp chair. He was staring over my shoulder back into the woods, and I turned, and that's when I saw it myself. At first it looked like dead tree branches moving around side to side in the trees about seven feet off the ground. It was darker at this point, and the moon's light was reflecting just right off the pointed sticks for us to see them. One might have thought it was the wind blowing through a dead tree, except there wasn't much of a breeze at all that night, and the movement wasn't in any kind of a rhythmic pattern. It seemed to be moving independently from everything else, all on its own. "'Who's out there?' Dad yelled. I'm not sure what it is he thought someone was doing to cause a tree to move in such a way, but what happened next had us both running up the trail for the jeep. All at once, the figure raised another full foot into the air, and then beneath the pointed sticks, through the darkness, shone a pair of glowing yellow eyes. Only when the eyes came into view did we realize that we were staring into what appeared to be a large deer's skull with antlers attached but it was at least eight feet off the ground at this point, probably closer to nine. We dropped everything and ran as fast and as hard as we could back to the Jeep. We didn't even bring our gear. Once inside, we agreed to head into Hot Springs for the night and get a hotel. We'd come back for the gear in the morning, we thought, when it was light out. We spent the whole night at the hotel, wide awake, talking about what we had seen and hoping that it wasn't real. Being a game fish and parks guy, Dad's initial hypothesis was that it simply was an elderly buck suffering from wasting disease, a sort of neurological disease that deer get that's common in the area, and it can cause deer to take on a zombie-like appearance. Ultimately, this is what we decided we'd seen and figured that we both just got spooked in the dead of the night and got jittery from not eating. The next day, though, when we returned to the campsite... That hypothesis was thrown to the wayside. Whatever we had seen had found our sight and completely torn our tents apart, snuffed out our fire, tossed everything we had around the forest floor. In the midst of the mess, there was this set of hoof prints at least ten inches front to back, all over the campsite. And that's only one set, mind you, not two. Whatever had been there was only walking on two feet. I don't think we'll be back to the hills anytime soon.
Wow, I am so glad to have found you. I mean, what do people do when there's no one to tell? No one who believes them. People already think I'm a bit of an odd duck, but seriously, I think it's because I have an open mind, and it freaks them out to hear me talk about how not everything in this world is within our control. Being unconventional is really what led me to this encounter in the first place, because normal people aren't out roaming neighborhoods at four o'clock in the morning. I just wanted to earn some extra money to send my kids to a good school and move out of my mother-in-law's house. I tried the usual job boards and help-wanted sections to find something part-time, but everything I found was going to interfere with my kids' schedules. So I finally paid attention to this flyer that kept showing up in our mail for newspaper deliverers. This was back in the day when that was still a thing. Problem was, I had to wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and I'm not an early riser by nature. I had to get down to the distribution center to roll up the papers and stuff them into bags. What a waste of plastic, really, but living in West Virginia, the weather is unpredictable and you can't imagine how angry people get over a damp newspaper. I had close to 300 papers to deliver. I'd pile them in the back seat of my car and get out to my route about 4 a.m. It was mostly peaceful, really. Everyone's still asleep except me. I'd look at the dark windows and wonder about all the people who lived there. There were a lot of rabbits out, too. And that's about the time when I became super aware of nocturnal creatures. Those bunnies were taking care of their business like it was the middle of the day. And the foxes. And the raccoons. All the people sleeping and oblivious to the worlds that opened up in the dark. And, at this particular time of year, moths. It was May, and I don't know if you're aware, but there are close to 2,000 species of moths in West Virginia. Moth eggs hatch between April and May, and I mean, some years they come out in swarming hordes. And that year was especially bad. They were everywhere. Parts of my route were easy. The residential neighborhoods with the houses in a row. Most of those people were fine with me just tossing their paper as close to the porch as I could get it. But there were always the ones, you know. They wanted their paper tucked in a specific slot beside a specific bush or under a particular beam of wood on the porch. Oh my gosh, I don't even know how these people live. For those houses, I had to get out of my car and tuck the paper in its exact spot. Everybody had their porch lights on, and guess what moths are attracted to? Yeah, light. So whenever I had to approach a porch, those buggers would swarm me. You can't imagine how they would flap and flutter all around and get caught in my clothes. And I had really long hair then, and they would swarm into my hair like they were going to build a cocoon in there. They really eked me out. My goal was always to get back to the car without bringing a bunch of them with me. It was impossible sometimes. And that was bad enough, but then you should have seen one of the apartment buildings I had to do. I had to go down this stairwell toward the incredibly bright lights they had lighting the entrance. There were hundreds of moths trapped in the stairwell. I guess they'd get down there and be unable to figure out how to get out. Picture me holding a huge bag of newspapers, fumbling with my master key to get in, and being pummeled by hundreds of moths swirling all around me. It truly looked like I was in a horror movie, and I'll tell you my paycheck did not reflect that. So I'd get in there and try to slam the door shut behind me, but inevitably dozens of moths would follow me in. It was endless. Like I said... That was an especially bad year for them. Anyway, that was all well and good. I would get in there and leave the papers and get out as fast as I could. But this night I came up the stairwell and laying there was this mangled raccoon. Well, it looked mangled, but also flattened and like it had somehow been sucked dry. I screamed so loudly. But then I'm running toward my car and I kid you not, something is crouching on the roof. I had parked in a dark spot to avoid the moths, you know, so it was hard to see exactly. But this thing was crouched and looked like it had huge black folded up wings and it was scratching at the roof of my car. It looked toward me then and its eyes were gleaming red. 
If you thought I screamed before, you should have heard me scream then. It was an ungodly scream, and I took off back to the apartment building. I was shaking like a leaf, but I managed to unlock the door and get back inside. I ran up the stairs to a landing and then looked out the window where I could see my car. And the thing was still there, scratching and scratching. What the actual hell? But then this thing stood up on my car, and it was the size of a man. And then it leapt into the air and just swooped away. I couldn't even move. It was petrifying. And we didn't have cell phones in those days. I waited there until sunrise, and then when somebody came out of their apartment to get their paper, I told them I was the delivery person, and I asked to use their phone. I said I had car trouble, which wasn't exactly a lie. I went outside when my husband came, and then all the moths in the stairwell were gone. In fact, there was no evidence of moths anywhere, but the roof of my car was a complete maze of scratches. Let me know what you think about these stories in the comments below. And don't forget to check out Donovan Dread, who releases almost every single day. Also, if you like true crime, then check out Donovan Dread True Crime. There are new releases several times a week.